I mean, you know, congratulations, because you are going to get to Congress now, because you're unopposed, but how are you going to even begin to take on the political culture that Donald Trump has created? I think, you know, be who I am. Uh, I think one of the important things to know is I'm going to be at home in the district as much as possible. I think it's really important that I stay rooted in the community, rooted in uh, what I promised, which is neighborhood service centers throughout my, my 13 congressional district. I think staying connected to them and making sure I elevate their voices is what's important. You know, I'm not there to change the complete culture of what, over probably three decades of a broken Congress. Uh, you know, over half of my colleagues there are millionaires. Uh, many of them may not really truly understand the challenge of having to send their child to a classroom with 45 students. Uh, so I want to, you know, stay real, stay rooted, and that's how I'm going to make sure that the kind of toxic maybe environment that is in Congress doesn't get in the way of me providing for my families. I mean, what you really need to be part of is the renewal of the Democratic Party, isn't it? Sure. I mean, but I do that by just serving my people, right? I mean, I don't have to be labeled a certain way. I don't have to be, you know, somehow in some sort of leadership position. I have to serve. I have to provide for the families of the 13 congressional district. That's how we revive what we call the Democratic Party reviving. That's the only way I know how to do it. Are you happy to say you're a socialist? You know, I am for universal health care. I'm for quality education and making sure there's no inequity when it comes to that. I'm for people having access to uh, buying their own homes, uh, to making sure that they don't have to uh, think that they are less than because they don't have uh, the income or maybe the education or the various status that are out there. That's what I'm for. These labels, to me, are what bogs us down in our country. And that's something I want to just shy away from, you know, just move away from that and and just talk about the issues and what I need to do to get to work to provide for my families in the 13th. But I mean, you know, I can see why you've got your position. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking over from a, you know, a radical congressman, John Conyers, you know, who, who pursued many... He was courageous. Many... I don't know radical, well, but he's courageous. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, he, he, he took up some, you know, positions even many Democratic colleagues wouldn't. Um, but the question is, you know, in the face of a populist right, in, in America, what, is gonna, what should be the Democratic Party's response? Should it be to, to, to be, you know, to take up the mantle of Bernie Sanders and everything he was saying, or should it be something else? Why can't it just be people-driven? Why can't we just be the party of human beings and making sure that we're elevating them out of poverty and making sure they have access to, be, or just human dignity? Because you need I a mean, vision, don't you? You do, but you know what? You do it through actions. Uh, I want to be able to make sure my families have resources now. I don't want to get involved in these kinds of political debates and conversations of if we do this, then this will happen. Let's do the blue wave. I want to own the ocean. I mean, this is what we need to be talking about to our families. They don't want to have these kinds of debates and political analogies about or analysis or, or describing, uh, are we going to follow Bernie? Are we going to follow this person? They want to be uh, uh, at the table when we talk about, you know, college, debt-free uh, college, talking about health care for all, talking yeah. about, you know, pay, pay equity for women. I mean, look, you're going to keep pushing and trying to want to stick me in a box, and it's just not going to happen. The only box I'm going to stick with is the 13th Congressional District, where my families need me and need me to fight for them. Yeah. No, I mean, just remember, this is the British media. I'm not trying to put you in a box. I'm trying to find out what you stand for. But, I mean, let's, 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 let's talk about... I stand for what I just told you, yeah. which is human dignity. No, that, that's fine. I mean, what is the significance of you being a Palestinian-American or being the first Muslim woman? I mean, do these things matter, do you think? to what you're doing? Absolutely. I, I think it matters to the whole world. Uh, I think when they see me, they see their daughter, they see their mother, they see their aunt, they see a little bit of who, where they came from, who they are. Uh, many of the so justice work that I'm very passionate about is rooted in my Palestinian an ancestry. Uh, many of it was birthed right there with my grandfather telling me about you know, him being displaced from his home. I, I can tell you that it is part of where my drive and passion comes from. Uh, and, and the fact that it is a huge significance because I do provide this very unique personal voice to that issue that I feel like people have, again, chose to let's choose sides instead of choosing for the people, all the people there, that they, everybody there deserves to thrive, to deserve to feel safe, deserves uh, respect and the fact that they don't need to look the other way and, and all of a sudden be a victim of violent um, attacks on, on villages and people that are innocent. Do you think Donald Trump is demonizing Muslims? Absolutely. 
And what impact is that having, do you think, on America? Huge. I have children, one of them of which told me that if he asked if he was Muslim, he will tell people he's not. Uh, that is the result of, some, of a president uh, who uh, dehumanizes people based on their faith, their sexual orientation, based on their sex, based on a lot of things that I think, you know, is not of um, what we really need in America. I mean, my story, me winning, is such a huge uh, victory in many ways, a powerful message that you can try to ban us from coming into the country, but you can't ban us from, from being elected to the U.S. Congress, for being at the table while you're talking about us. You know, for far too long, many of us, I hear from my African-American neighbors where, you know, they say, hey, we're always on the menu, but we're never at the table to discuss what is going to happen to our future. And so for me being there, I'm going to be at the table when those conversations happen and to make sure that I give everyone a voice. My child should not be growing up in this beautiful country of ours, and it is. If something like this could happen, somebody like me getting elected, it is still very much a possibility of that beauty to really resonate, to, to be uplifted and to, to go against uh, the ugliness and darkness that is coming from the White House. Uh, my son should be proud, proud of where he comes from, where his ancestors are from, proud to say, yes, I am of Muslim faith, and yes, I'm an American, Arab American, uh, all those things I think that are really important and make us the country that we are here. And as a Palestinian, what's your position on Israel and U.S. aid to Israel? Look, I am a person that grew up in Detroit, where every single corner of the district is a reminder of the civil rights movement. Uh, if it's not uh, pushing back on uh, corporate greed when it came to uh, uh, segregation, when it came to uh, access to quality jobs and all those things, I can tell you when I was 12 years old, I sat there with my mother when she was shifted into a line with all the other brown people and then all the other folks, you know, mostly citizens of Israel in another section, and the way that she was treated less than, that inequality that is, is very evident when you're there, when you understand truly that equality, justice, uh, access to all those things is solely based on your faith there, solely based on your ethnicity, to me, you were never going to get peace until we start talking about integration. And so we start talking about, you know, instead of walls and checkpoints, talking about how we can connect people. And that divide will decrease. So many of us are so uh, much about, let's choose a side. Well, I'm for uh, equality for all, for making sure every single person there has every right to thrive. I know what happens to families when they're attacked, when they're unarmed, when they don't know what exactly is happening. That dehumanization is toxic, and it's only going to get worse if we don't handle it from this perspective, from coming and choosing a value versus choosing a side, Palestine versus Israel. And so when you get into Congress, will you vote against U.S. military aid for Israel? Absolutely. If it has something to do with inequality and not access to people having justice and to, to stop, for me, U.S. aid should be leverage. It should be leverage to promote that value. If you're going to be a country that discriminates against someone solely based on their faith, solely based on their skin color in many ways, because there are Israelis now in, uh, that because they're darker skin, they're not being treated equally, to me, that is, doesn't fit our value of our country. So I will be using my position as a member of Congress to say no country, not one, should be able to get aid from us, the American people, who talk about it, justice and equality and stopping discrimination, to say a country can come and get aid from us when they still promote that kind of um, uh, injustice that I saw in Detroit, or in, in, in especially in my neighbors who went through the civil rights movement in Detroit and told me how it was to be able to be divided on buses, to be able to go to schools that were not uh, of good quality. Those are the kinds of things that I think I come with in that lens that I feel like will change the conversation and we'll be moving closer to peace when we do talk about that. As I'm sure you'll have seen, Britain's going through many of the similar sorts of debates. Um, around identity and religion um, that have been playing out in a different way in America. Um, our former foreign secretary is in trouble over some comments he made in a newspaper article about women who wear niqabs and, and burqas, ridiculing them. What have you made of what you've seen from across the pond? Look, you know, I, I heard about this, and, and I, it's interesting we call it a debate, right? Uh, look, there are human beings 
that uh, dress differently. You know, I remember my mother telling me, ooh, he has a tattoo, you gotta be careful. I mean, this is a woman that took a while to understand, the, you know, what is on the outside of a person. Uh, the fact that we're sitting there looking at this person as if they're less than just because based on what they're dressed like. But also enough with having religion be so incorporated into government, into public service. Uh, you have to be a leader. You have to be about connecting people, not about shutting them down. This is not high school. This is not school uh, little uh, you know, back and forth of bullying somebody and saying, you know, you gotta stop this, you gotta stop that. No one is forcing that gentleman to wear the niqab. No one is forcing him to say, well, that's I'm gonna dress like that person. She has every right. Any woman has every right to dress exactly the way she wants to. And I'm really tired of people calling it a debate when it's obviously blatant racism and blatant insecurity on his part that he feels threatened by a woman on how she dresses. Rashida Sleeve, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.